A chip shop in Poznan. It would be hard to imagine a more unlikely title for a book about Poland. But then again, nothing about British author Ben Aitken's year as an immigrant in Poland was going to be that typical. We speak to him about his latest book. And I'm here with Ben now. It's uh, coming up to half past five in the morning, uh, a time that you're probably quite familiar with, coming, judging from your book. Yeah, I recognise the hour. <laughs> five, quarter past five, I'd often be returning home from one or another hospitality venue in Poznan. <laughs> I often passed my flatmate Yenji on the stairs. He was going to work, I was coming back from the pub and he would just kind of take it in his stride and say, you know, hello, Benny. And I'd say, you know, Jen Bobri, and then that would be it. Now, uh, we've recorded this at this particular time because it's almost thematically uh, in line with the book, but what we do have is quite a lot of uh, midges and flies just flying around us. So if me and Ben are swatting around our heads, you, you now know why. But he, luckily he has an implement, which is this book, Ben, yes. which you've written. Don't be mistaken, I'm not trying to <laughs> Whack Patrick round the head after his impertinent questioning. <laughs> after? I haven't got to that bit yet. So the, the book is called A Chip Shop in Poznan. What the hell is that about? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I worked in a fish and chip shop of all places in Poland. Why? Because the owner of the, the, the fish and chip shop, which was also a bar on the beach, the River Varta, just felt that she needed an English person in the role. You know, I didn't, have, I didn't have either qualification or motivation. And yet she was like, no, you must have it just in the blood, as if it was some hereditary kind of sixth sense. I just knew, knew how to cook fish and chips. Of course, I, I didn't. So it was chaos. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple of incidents in the book, including where you had to do a, a sort of big party for, I think it was, you know, several, several dozen people or over 100 people. Yeah. Uh, with yeah, you and your mate Tim. It was, a, yeah, Tim, Tim Haig, bless him, uh, uh, formerly of the BBC, uh, came over for holiday and ended up working uh, on the barbecue with me to kind of serve a, a, an IT company. It was their annual kind of uh, summer party or something like that. And he turns up kind of relaxed, I think, with a beer in his hand at the start. And by the end, he's literally in, in the furnaces. Sort of oh, yeah, gosh, yeah. He's pulling his hair out and he's swearing in Polish. You know, he was uh, tr transformed <laughs> by the end of it. I think, and also to get the barbecue lit, you had to pour a little bit of vodka on, if I remember rightly. I don't remember that. Maybe, maybe I'm just making but it But that was probably, we'd already had a few vodkas, probably why uh, I don't remember that. Okay. So there's lots of uh, semi-comic, uh, moments in this book. Did you set out to write comedy about Poland or so you just reported what you no, saw? No, absolutely. If you try and write comedy, you're probably not going to achieve it. I have a sense of humour just as anyone else does and the articulation or the, the journaling of the, the year in Poland, you know, is going to contain that sense of humour. You know, it won't be everyone's cup of tea, but there are elements of the absurd in the process and in the act of moving to Poland to work in a fish and chip shop and teaching as well because I taught in a school initially. Yeah. So when you go into a school and address you know, a bunch of Polish eight-year-olds and try and impart wisdom, you know, it's, going to, it's going to lead to kind of comic uh, stuff. Yeah, and now you're saying in the book that you, you're setting out essentially to see what it looks like from the other side. So there's lots of Polish immigrants uh, doing great jobs and many doing tough jobs in the UK and you wanted to come over as a British person and see what life was like uh, in Poland itself. Yeah, I, wanted, I understood that the Polish people are notoriously patriotic and so why in their millions over the course of 15 years were they leaving the home they loved? You know, what were they turning their backs on? You know, it was, it, I was curious to, dis, to, to discover that and mostly what I was hearing about Poland and Polishness was quite negative in the British press. You know, and in my experience, the things that, you know, are often disparaged or criticised or receive the least attention, have the most value. So I wanted to go the other way and have a look. Now there are a lot of bittersweet moments in the book. There's a kind of failed love affair. Uh, I'm surprised by how candid you are about some of your personal failings, uh, inadequacies, uh, as, as defined by yourself, but also by the people around you. Uh, I think there's a wonderful moment where someone leaves a little note saying, you will never love, uh, you will never be loved if you don't change your personality. I think I'm Oh yeah, that, that, will, that will be my uh, flatmate, Anna Yenjechak. Um, 
Nietzsche said that our best friends are also our best enemies because they've earned the license, to be honest. Well, Anna doesn't wait to earn the license. She's just honest straight away. She's like, <laughs> Benny, stand up. Benny, your Polish is disgusting. Benny, if you don't change your personality, you will never find love. And I like to think she has a point. <laughs> uh, I would probably be a little bit more reticent about some of the things I did in my first year in Poland. I probably wouldn't have mentioned some of the things you did. Did, did you want to be, you know, sort of um, almost painfully honest at times? Yeah, I wanted it to be an exercise in telling an honest story. It's not easy to be honest. It's easier to curate your experience, especially if you've got an editing process, and then you can offer to the readers or be it people that are checking out your Facebook profile the version of yourself you want, harder to give them how you actually behave. It's how we behave in private that characterizes and determines who, who we are. And I guess I wanted to try and share that, but without you know it being too disrespectful or too, too graphic. You know, I'm not doing heinous things. It's not Fifty Shades of Poland or anything like that, but everybody morally, ethically, Behaviorally, you have ups and downs, and I wanted to catch the downs as well as the ups. Well, I mean, there is a moment where you're, you're in some sort of plush club, uh, <laughs> being fed drinks by. Well, we won't go into that. <laughs> Did it make the final cut? Yeah, yeah. I, I found myself in what I thought was a language exchange bar in Wrocław at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, it wasn't. It was actually um, a kind of dance club, and. I think I was drugged and woke up two hours later with just my black socks on. I thought my feet had gone weird, you know, but yeah, let's, 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 move, let's on. move on. Let's move on. <laughs> in some respects, so it's, it's almost like a sort of every man experience because you, you fall in love, you, you've tried to learn a language and you've had a bunch of <laughs> ridiculous situations come out of not being able to speak the language. You've, you've been in that kind of cultural place where you're looking at things from your perspective and trying to understand what is making these people tick. Uh, did you want to write a book which was for that particular type of audience? Well, mówiłem po polsku trochę, you know, so I can speak Polish a bit. I wasn't completely abhorrent and um, flippant and debauched the whole time. And you say it's an every man experience, but geez, not every man decides to move to Poland in order to work on the minimum wage and efficient chip shop, the better to understand that country, the better to understand his own country, the better to understand the relationship between the two countries and their relation to Europe at a time when some interesting political stuff was going on. Brexit, Trump, the new Polish government, etc. Yes. So although I accept your suggestion that its, it's themes are relatable and maybe, maybe universal and ordinary, the, 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 the concept of the book and the overall shape of the book and trajectory, you know, is, it isn't. No, I'd accept that and uh, maybe I'll ask this from a, from a different angle then. What, what kind of readership do you think is going to be interested in, the, in that kind of book about Poland? Well, hopefully my nan will read it, <laughs> at least once. Uh, I'll just sit there and watch her reading it and make sure she finishes it. <laughs> no, gosh, you know, with, we were talking off camera about Michael Moran's book, The Country in the Moon, and it's, it's, it's gorgeous and it's erudite, but it's, it can be difficult, and it focuses unapologetically on, on Chopin, on, on culture, on high culture, on history. I guess I wanted to offer something different, not lowbrow, no, but something with a light heart and an occasionally serious head that gives people that aren't familiar with Poland, that aren't accustomed to reading dense history, a way into this country yeah. that they otherwise wouldn't have had. Now you put yourself in all sorts of different situations, including one, perhaps one of the most memorable bits, where you invite yourself into someone else's house for Christmas. Tell us about that. Well, I heard about the tradition of uh, leaving an extra place setting on the table on Christmas Eve. And everybody respected this tradition, everybody knew about it, but no one ever experienced somebody coming to take that extra space, you know, for the, the, for the imagined stranger. And so I thought I'd test it out. So on, on Christmas Eve, I went out when the, I saw the first star in the sky and picked a suitable house, rang on the doorbell, three kids charged to the front window. <gasps> mm. No, who are you? You're not Father Christmas. <laughs> the mother opened the door, shooed the children back into the dining room where it was safe, and then said, Doug? Yeah? And I said, my rehearsed lines are uh, Yestem Benjamin, Yestem Zangli, Swishalem, to jest tradicja. And finally she said, well, you're a bit late, but come in. <laughs> and so I had two hours with them, you know, the 
maternal <laughs> grandfather was a bit, you know, perturbed by the whole thing. You know, he didn't un recognize this modern dinner party sort of thing. <laughs> but finally, it was a wonderful experience and in many ways characterized the whole year in Poland. It was surreal, it was awkward, it was rich, it was generous, it was formative, it was unlikely. Yeah, uh, and that's a wonderful moment to end our interview, uh, Ben. Now, you've got a particular section that you're going to read our viewers uh, from the book because you also taught English to a, a, a class of kids, didn't you? Yeah, before I got the, the job in the fish and chip shop, I worked in a school, an after school. So the kids had already been to school and they came to the school to learn some English and they were ready to burst because they'd already had enough education and they they encountered me, they thought I was stupid because I couldn't speak Polish. They could speak Polish when they were three years old. Therefore, I'm dumb, they didn't, I didn't deserve their respect. <laughs> they went crazy. So I'm going to read you a small passage uh, taken from my last day at the school. Okay, awesome. Now I've also heard <laughs> a rumour, Ben, that you get book-related tattoos. So what's your tattoo for this particular book? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking off, uh, off the top of my head. I tell you what. If we get 100,000 shares, is views, that a thing? Views a bit. Is that the right verb? 100,000 views, uh, I will get I love pierogi tattooed on this pectoral. <laughs> and we can, I tell you what, we can do a live stream from a tattoo parlour. I know one just over there. <laughs> Well, I can't think of a better challenge than that to end <laughs> this rather remarkably unusual interview. Uh, and so now we will hear from Ben reading this and whoever thought about recording an interview with these midges flying around, uh, we'll be speaking to them shortly after. So let's turn it over to Ben and his beautiful reading. I'm Ben Aitken, author of A Chip Shop in Pelsna and My Unlikely Year in Poland. And I'm going to read an excerpt from that book, dated 16th of June, 2016. It is my last day at the school. I'm rested and clear-headed, an out-of-body experience for me. For once, the lessons are something to relish rather than survive. I'm in a playful mood, so I climb under the table, bang on the window, sit on the edge of my seat and throw up my hand desperately in a bid for attention. I am pretending to be Nella, the class know what I'm doing. They know what the game is. Everyone is laughing and smiling apart from Nella, who pretends to be deeply offended by it all. And they are listening too. I know they are listening because when I make a mistake on purpose, I bang the window, present simple. I banged the window, past simple. I was banging the window, present continuous. They are quick to correct me. Past continuous, they shout. When I quit being Nella, they make me do someone else. I choose Lucas, the devil child, whose good behaviour of late can only be explained by absenteeism. He doesn't flinch. He takes it in his stride. He doesn't blush or balk or bark or bite when I make stupid faces or poke people or take their pencils or randomly walk out of the room or pick my nose or heckle the teacher or feign stupidity or foster rebellion or draw inappropriate things on the whiteboard with a permanent marker. Then Lucas decides enough is enough, that I need some of my own medicine, who puts on my jacket and my sunglasses and says, Hello, my name is Ben and I am from England and I can't speak Polish, but everybody knows this because it is very obvious. This gets applause from his classmates. Sometimes I must leave the room and be lonely for five minutes because in my opinion, the children are too bad. He's reveling. I don't mind. He can say what he wants if he says it like that. The others in the class watch through their hands. Olivia, hardly a stranger to misbehaviour, can't believe what she is seeing. Lucas writes a few Polish words on the board, the words for road, bridge, pasta, then asks the class, please help me. Polish is no easy. How do you say this words? I bring the curtain down on Lucas's performance when the words he writes on the board, judging by the reaction of the class, become unpleasant. I tell Lucas that I prefer Lucas how he is, rather than how he isn't. He doesn't let it show, but I can tell the remark sneaks under his defences and makes an impression. I can see a little pride in his face, in his eyes. He's fighting back a smile. The class has run over by five minutes. The children waiting outside are doubtless wondering what the hell's going on in there. Lucas comes to me with a dog-eared sheet of A4 paper on which his behaviour is monitored. 
If he is too frequently bad, then his parents are informed. I write that he was very good, then correct this to is very good. He offers a fist bump, then walks out of my life, and I can't help but look upwards and thank God. So that was the chip shop in Poznan, my unlikely year in Poland. Contains an unlikely immigrant, an unsung country, a bumpy romance, several shattered preconceptions, traces of insight, a dozen nuns and a referendum. Proszę bardzo.